So if you have any questions left over from yesterday that you suddenly thought about or anything that kept you awake last night, if you've been, if you were at the first session, uh, pop in some chat, a question or statement about yesterday's webinar. Now we'd love to see that. Let's get to the first slide. So that's some of the things we'll be covering today. There's a few uh, other bits and pieces that came out from yesterday's session as well. That Daniel will be covering. I'm a bit silent at the moment because I forgot to move a couple of files that I need for the webinar into the right folder. <laughs> no worries, so I'm, I'm re reorganizing my, my file structure at the moment. No worries. Okay, right. Thank you for your question, Zark. I'll uh, note that. Mm -hmm. um, I already can tell you the answer. You simply don't. You definitely need a texture map. So if you have a procedural terrain, um, you need to convert it to a standard terrain and export the grayscale map as a height map. And um, then make sure in Photoshop that the, uh, the map encompasses all grayscale values. So from total black to, to pure white so that the map has the maximum contrast. But you definitely need uh, the terrain in a um, height map form for the displacement uh, to work. Yeah, so thank you for everyone's uh, involvement yesterday. Um, and uh, yeah, if you do want to uh, put in a, some reaction in the chat to what you see, uh, that's always that's always good. Um, and if you want Daniel to stop to drill down on something, to go, go over something in more detail, that's what this webinar is all about. It's two way. It's interactive. Uh, we will let you know when we get to a Q and A session because uh, we do like to tend to bunch up questions together. That's just a, a little bit more efficient for us in the use of the time today. And we will be... Okay, so Don, I'll, just, I'll help out Don here. Let's check out which, and there's several Dons in the room. Okay, Don, you got your sound working, good. Okay, Daniel, let me know when you're ready to go after you've got your files ready. Um, I think I'm good to go. Okay. Okay. So welcome everyone to part two of Clouds Unraveled. This is a webinar that is copyright 2019 Digital Art Live and Daniel Seabacker, who's presenting today. So please give him a warm welcome as he uh, goes over more tips and hints of how to get your clouds under control and to see some really good uh, some time-saving uh, tips on how to do that. Um, so please give him a warm welcome and your support in the webinar would be appreciated by uh, showing any questions that you have or just making the most of your time uh, since Daniel's uh, spent some, some good hours preparing for this session today. So thank you, Daniel. Take it away. Thanks, Paul. So I'll try to share my screen.
Okay, so um, again, hello everyone. Great to be back for the second session. And again, thank you so much for attending. It's really appreciated. Um, so today we're going to have the second session uh, on clouds in view. And so this is what we're going to do today. For those who weren't um, present yesterday, I'll do a quick recap of the most important uh, points that we covered yesterday. And um, then we'll um, tackle the question and answers during the webinar some, some time. So um, Pierre asked me about um, animating clouds with uh, time-based inputs. And that's something that I'm going to show. Um, then he also asked me about um, creating rainbow coloring around openings in a cloud layer, which is something that I prepared. And we're also going to talk about how to create cloud zones procedurally because um, yesterday the question came up whether cloud zones um, were always round or not. And um, yeah, there, there is a different way of limiting clouds to um, a zone directly in the function and this yields better results actually than a cloud zone. So we'll be covering that as well. Um, then we'll have a look at how clouds actually interact with the atmosphere, which means we'll look at uh, what exactly um, is responsible for creating God rays in an atmosphere. We will have a look at the different colors and how they influence clouds. And um, I'll also point out the differences between photometric and standard spectral atmospheres. And um, yesterday I wanted to, sh to build some Mimetus clouds. Um, so we weren't able to do that due to time constraints, but I'm going to open the scene nonetheless and uh, show it to you so that you have an idea on how to approach um, the cloud design of strange formations. And um, then we'll be creating an underlit sunset based on what we learned about atmospheres as well. Um, we'll have a quick look at planetary clouds um, just a really, really quick one so that you know how, how it works in theory. And then we'll switch over to meta clouds and I'll say a few words about how they work in generally and what's new about them in the latest version. Um, there are three new features that are pretty handy. Um, one is the ability to convert any object or mesh into a meta cloud. And then we will look at how to export cloud layers and meta clouds into other applications as OpenBDB. And um, you can also import OpenBDBs back as meta clouds into the most recent view version. So I think we've got a lot to cover. And so uh, let's get started right away. So just to refresh your memory, um, what we learned yesterday was that a cloud is actually made up of, of two components in view. If I add a cloud into the scene in the atmosphere editor, view creates actually two elements. One is um, a cloud object, so to speak, which is the cloud layer uh, visible right here in the world browser and which it has a defined height and starting point, but an infinite width and depth. And um, the second element is the actual cloud material that creates the shapes. And the cloud layer, uh, which again is represented here with that gray box, is a window into the world of clouds. So when we extend the height of the cloud layer, we simply make more or less of the cloud material visible. Or by moving it up or down, we see a different portion of the cloud material. So um, the material itself is always tied to the scene world origin at 0, 0, 0, and it uses world standard mapping as the mapping mode. And yeah, the, the, the cloud layer is the window above and below uh, the cloud layer. The clouds continue, but you cannot see them. And shapes in clouds are created um, with uh, one of two methods. So the, um, the clouds themselves scatter light and how light scatters is defined by the density of the cloud. And density in clouds is the same as transparency. So what we're actually doing is we're using um, patterns and noises and fractals or texture maps um, between black and white and, the, and we're controlling the density or transparency of our cloud layer this way. So black parts in an image or in a function correspond to 100% transparency, which means there's a hole in the cloud material through which we can see the sky. 
and white means the cloud is 100% opaque and gray is anything in between. Um, that's one way to create clouds. And the second way is um, instead of um, creating different transparent spots in the material, we can leave the material at 100% of opacity so that it has no transparent spots at all. And we can um, instead displace um, our um, window, our cloud layer, um, so that we're not seeing anything with the transparency, but the window itself takes on the shape of clouds. And this is, uh, works with uh, the height modulation, if we simply want to displace the top of the cloud. And it also works with the altitude offset, which will displace the bottom and the top in a parallel fashion. So this sums up the most important things about working with clouds in a nutshell. And if you weren't present yesterday, I hope this gives you an idea of what we are doing. Um, so yesterday we had a look at all the different um, modulation functions. Actually, I didn't cover every, every single modulation function, um, but there are um, a few more points that I want to explain before we uh, go on to atmosphere interaction. Um, so basically, um, a modulation is a way to make um, these settings in here irregular. So right now we have the same opacity everywhere in the cloud, 74%, or uh, we have the same starting altitude of our cloud layer at one kilometer. And so these sliders are multiplied these ones with the values we set here. So for example, we currently have a height of 2.2 kilometers. If I set the height modulation slider to 50%, then um, the height is reduced by 50% and we, we'd now have 1.1 kilometers as the height. So basically, um, this is like a replication of the sliders uh, we have here in the atmosphere editor and 100% corresponds to whatever you enter uh, in here. And um, by clicking any of these buttons, you can replace the slider with a function and thus make it irregular and uh, create an irregular height or an irregular starting altitude, for example. And this irregularity looks like displacement. So two things that we haven't looked at yesterday were um, the sharpness modulation, the opacity modulation, but you can already uh, guess what they do. Um, you can use these functions to actually um, yeah, make the opacity and the sharpness irregular in the cloud so that, uh, for example, um, you don't have sharpness added everywhere at the cloud. If you only want to have some sharpness added, I don't know, at the left half of, of the, the scene, then you could probably um, use a grayscale map uh, with uh, white to the left and black to the right. And you have to scale and place the grayscale map in the function editor so that um, yeah, it covers the, the field of view of your camera. And in this case, um, we would not have a sharpness added um, on, at the right half of, of the scene because uh, we, uh, the, the texture map is black in there, so 0% sharpness, and we'd only have sharpness on the left side. So it also works the same with opacity, and um, actually you can use the opacity modulation, um, for example, to create uh, patterns in the shadow areas. I can give you an example. So let's um, create the opacity modulation. And um, again, we'll be using our um, uh, handy rectangular noise from yesterday um, because it's always pretty handy for demonstration purposes. So I'll add our rectangular noise in here and connect it to the position and to the opacity and let's set the values to 100 meters. And now I can um, see, probably not as good, but it should still give you an idea that we have a rectangular pattern within our um, shadow area. So um, let me remove the, the detail mount so that we get a better view. Um, yes, yeah, so the, these stripes that you see in here are actually the rectangular shapes that we just created. So both the, the sharpness and the opacity modulation 
um, are seldom used uh, modulation functions, but if you need that extra amount of control or, or um, yeah, abstract sci-fi detail in the case of shadows, then um, they're there for you. Okay, so this concludes all of the uh, functions that a cloud consists of, except for the color functions to which we'll come back in a few minutes. Okay, so um, how does the atmosphere interaction work with clouds? Um, so everything that I'm going to tell you now is valid for both the photometric atmospheric model and the spectral atmosphere model. The difference between both models is the light intensity. So let, let me switch to the sky fog and haze tab. Currently we're in photometric mode. So photometric is a physical light unit. Um, it ca carries over from physics and for example, you've probably heard of lumen or candela before or lux as the unit for, for light intensities. And um, these values can also be found on, on on bulbs that you that you buy in a, at a store, indicating how bright a bulb is. So when you work in photometric mode, you work with real-world lighting units, and um, the atmosphere model is designed to reflect the intensity of the light of the sun of the real world. And um, the sunlight is incredibly bright. It's, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of lumen or, or candela or whatever, I don't know. Um, but it's really, really bright. And uh, on, on the other side, a really bright light can also create a, a star contrast. So at the same time, shadows in this mode are really, really dark. But this is a physical behavior um, true to nature. And the, the atmosphere model also reflects um, the average thickness of um, our ozone and, and atmosphere layer around Earth. So the 8.8 .8 kilometers indicated here actually correspond to real physical um, world values. When I switch to standard spectral, which I'll do now, um, you will see that the values immediately changed. So the standard spectral does not have um, real world atmospheric scale in mind. Yes, it works in real world units, but um, it's a more like artistic approach. So um, the standard spectrum model is a little bit easier to handle um, because the light isn't as bright, which means things are not um, um, as easily overexposed or underexposed in the case of shadows. Um, and so this is, this is now no longer based on um, real world physical um, lighting values. Um, this is like just a general artistic approximation of an atmosphere that looks good. Um, many people actually prefer the standard spectral model to the photometric one um, because due to the physical light intensity of the photometric model, um, there's a problem with materials. So contrasts of materials are often um, too extreme and highlights are way too bright and overexposed. And the main reason for that is that the standard materials from you are not physically correct. So we have a physically correct um, atmosphere model with photometric intensities, but a non-physical material system. And fortunately, that changed with um, the current view version. And we now have PBR materials, which is a physical-based rendering uh, material. So the material is now also physically correct. Um, in, in the way that it works. And this means if you create physically correct PBR materials, then highlights, for example, will no longer be as overexposed as with standard materials. So for an older version, we always had that mismatch between non-physical materials and physical um, atmospheres. And now you can combine the best of both worlds. Um, personally, I prefer photometric because the colors are not as satur saturated as in standard spectral. Um, and I like that it's physically correct, but that's just my personal um, taste because I prefer more photoreal renderings. And for many people, standard spectral is the preferred model because you can be more artistic in there and you don't have to cope with adjusting your materials as much. So it's a matter of taste. But the principles that we're looking at now apply to both um, 
models at the same time. Um, yeah, and Karen is of course totally right. Um, the, the altitudes can obviously change depending on, on where you are. So this is like an average, um, an, an average uh, value that, that Ian chose here, but it's at least a lot more realistic than the one that uh, you have in standard spectral. Um, and if you're using older versions, uh, well, I've been using photometric nonetheless um, in older versions as well, since it was introduced in 2014. Um, and render time used to go up a lot in older versions, but um, from 2015 and above, render times are exactly identical. So there is no, no downside to using photometric atmospheres um, regarding render time. So it's really up to you which, which look you prefer. Okay, that was quite a monologue. <laughs> so <laughs> I think we should go back to actually, um, yeah, seeing something on screen. <laughs> um, okay, so I reverted back to, to uh, photometric spectral. Um, and so let's have a look at how the atmosphere actually works in view. Um, so when the sun lowers on the horizon, um, light, uh, the, the light is scattered differently. I think Karen could explain that uh, m uh, more correctly than me, um, but I, it has to, to, to do with certain wavelengths that are filtered or scattered, I'm not sure. And either way, um, it causes light to turn red. And the decay amount setting controls how red something uh, turns depending on um, the sun position in the sky. And and the mean altitude of all the settings of fog and haze and sky and decay um, define um, the, um, um, the altitude where um, the color reaches its maximum, um, or, or sorry, it's, it's um, yeah, it, it's sort of the upper limit of um, where the color still uh, has um, some influence. So, um, with values higher than 8.8 kilometers, for example, the, uh, the influence of the decay color will um, decrease rapidly. So um, by using these sliders, you control the color intensity, so to speak. And um, by using the altitude sliders, you can define whether the entire sky turns red, for example, or only um, the lower portion. So if I were to tone this down, we can see that um, the, the reddish part of the sky is now restricted to uh, the lower part. So the less um, decay, uh, sorry, the, the less uh, mean altitude you have, uh, the more amount you need to color that accordingly. So if you have a scene where you would like to have some sunset colors, um, but you don't want the, the overall scene lighting to be um, so reddish, then it's a good idea to lower the, um, the altitude of the decay so that the, um, the upper parts of the sky still remain blue. And this will cause the light that comes from the sky on the ground to not be as red, but you will still get um, some nice sunset colors on the horizon. Um, and so haze is actually the way to make clouds fade out um, into the distance which was also a question that came up yesterday. So let's add a cloud layer, um, any cloud layer, doesn't matter. Um, and 150 meters is pretty low. And so if I remove the haze, um, we can see that um, why the, while the clouds still fade out into the distance, um, they don't fade out as strongly as before. So the more haze you add into the scene, um, the more the clouds start to blend into the horizon, but of course, the darker um, the scene itself uh, gets as well. Um, and fog is like a second version of haze um, that is uh, that not only occurs in the distance, but quite um, close to the camera. And so you can use these different settings to um, yeah, create the, the different colors in the atmosphere. And from all the things that you do here, view calculates an average skylight color. So uh, let me reset that back to 20% to the default and remove uh, the ground, uh, for ground density. And now let's increase the decay mean altitude. Um, and let's switch back to the light tab. You can see that the overall skylight color has changed because 
uh, we now added more red or, or yellow into our um, atmosphere. And um, so the, the average light that comes from the sky, of course, changes the, the color tone or, or the hue. Um, and this overall skylight color determines the color that the cloud takes on uh, by adding ambient lighting to it. So yesterday I said that ambient lighting brightens up the cloud itself and also the shadow areas. So I'll give you an example. Let's add more ambient light to that so that we can see um, the shadow areas a little more. And I'll reset that one to 8.8 kilometers. And let's increase the intensity maybe. Yes, and now you can see that the bright um, parts of the cloud layer that are actually lit by the sun um, take on the hue of um, the, the red decay color because the cloud is located at an altitude of 2.3 kilometers, which is within the range of 8.8 .8 kilometers. So if you want to color clouds red, make sure that um, the cloud itself is located within um, the, the altitude that you indicate here. And at the same time, the shadow areas take on the average um, skylight color. So let me set this to something unrealistic, such as green, for example. Um, and let me increase the intensity a bit. Maybe remove that altogether. And theoretically, we should see a stronger effect. Why are we not seeing a stronger effect? Uh, probably because of the density, um, which was too high. So let's add more opacity to create more shadows. And let's darken the entire atmosphere a little. Um, yeah, so actually I was expecting the, the color shade of our um, shadow areas to turn red or green. Why isn't that happening? <laughs> um, theoretically, it should happen. Whoops. Now I pressed the new button. <laughs> um, so let's add that back in and set it to one kilometer. Um, I'll try it again. So it was supposed to work. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I'm sorry, uh, why? Ah, I know why it's not working, because it's a preset cloud. Yes. Aha, okay. So there we are. <laughs> now it's working. So the overall color cast of um, the shadow areas in particular is controlled by that overall skylight color. And actually, the option that I just turned off was something that I wanted to show you as a consequence of this setting. If you don't want the cloud to be affected by um, the average color of your atmosphere, there is a checkbox on the lighting and effects tab, which is called force ambient color. And if you click that, um, the cloud no longer uses the average ambient color from, from the skylight, from the atmosphere, but you can instead specify two different ambient colors for uh, parts that are lit by the sun in the cloud. Um, so the bright white parts and uh, things that are lit only by ambient light and not by the sun, or in other words, the shadow areas, and this is the sky ambient color. So let's give this a try. I'll. Um, set the sky ambient color to a red color. And you can see that the shadow areas turned red immediately while the white parts were not affected. And let's use, a, I don't know, a green or, or a blue color for the sun ambient color. And now we can clearly see which parts of the clouds are lit by the sun and which um, parts of the clouds lie in the shadows. And instead of using, yeah, that overall skylight color, you can now uh, specify two different ambient colors um, to your own liking. And if I uncheck this, then we're back to 
um, the overall skylight color that we indicated here. And so this basically controls um, the colors of clouds in the atmosphere. So the mix of all the settings in here creates a um, overall skylight color that you can also override with your own color and that one controls the coloring of the clouds. Um, there's also the ambient light color and this is similar to doing color grading in post. So if I were to set this to a darker shade of blue, um, the entire scene including the ground and all the other objects now get a bluish color tint or a color cast. Let's set this to a red value and see what that looks like or orange one. Yes, so this is like um, an additional post grading filter that is applied on the ent uh, entire scene. So if you want um, to yeah, create a certain mood, evoke a certain um, weather condition, um, for example, just before the storm or after the storm, um, use a brownish color, for example, to create a darker, a more, more moody and, and a grim appearance for your scene. Okay, so any questions about this uh, so far? Why is the light color grayed out? Um, that's because we're using global radiosity and the light color, um, sorry, not global radiosity, we're using a, sp a standard spectral atmosphere mode. And if we were to switch to standard or volumetric as the atmospheric models, which, are, uh, which don't support volumetric clouds, then the lighting model is also a lot simpler than what we have here. And the light color is not controlled by the sun by these settings, um, but only with the color that you indicate here. So for spectral atmospheres, both standard and photometric, this value is always grayed out because it's for the old simple atmosphere models. Any other questions on color? Nope. Okay. okay. Um, there's uh, one more checkbox in here, and which is called apply settings um, to sky and clouds. So um, I just m played a bit with light intensity, and this is a bit similar to um, both raising or lowering the exposure of the scene, and also um, raising or lowering the intensity of the ambient light. So if you were to um, adjust the, the um, brightness of the ambient light color and the exposure in the main camera, it's sort of the same in two steps as moving the slider. And um, generally speaking, this um, controls the intensity of all the lights in your, in your uh, scene at the same time. So if I had uh, more than the sunlight in here, then we could make all lights universally brighter or darker at once, depending on whether I say this slider should apply to all lights or only to sunlight. What it doesn't influence by default is the reflected indirect light that the cloud reflect into the clouds reflect into the atmosphere and on the ground. And if you want to also change the brightness of th this in, um, reflected ambient light, which is a subtle effect, then you also check to sky and clouds. So let me give that a try. I don't know if it's visible in here. So we just made the entire scene darker. Let's uncheck this. Um, yeah, it's hardly visible in that scene, but the ground is just a tiny bit lighter because we didn't darken the reflected ambient light that's coming from the clouds. Um, and being reflected around the scene. So it's really subtle and it depends on, on the kind of scene that you see. Um, indirect atmospherics um, means that view will um, actually calculate physically correct indirect um, reflection um, parts from, from the clouds instead of um, only approximating them. So indirect atmospherics are um, also a subtle effect which is mostly noticeable in sunset scenes where we have a lot of um, yeah, like dark parts and only um, a few um, yeah, bright spots. And so um, this increases the calculation times by quite an order of magnitude and is not visible in your typical daylight scene. If you have a sunset, you can check it and you'll see how the indirect lighting changes um, in your scene just quite subtly. 
um, but it's unchecked by default because in 95% of all cases, simply using an approximation together with the ambient light color um, is enough for your scene. And finally, um, we have that uh, light balance slider. And this controls whether um, you use more ambient light, which will result in a more overcast scene, or whether you want to use more sunlight, which will um, yeah, create darker shadows and um, stronger contrasts, and which is great for sunset scenes. The realistic distribution and physically correct distribution is 50%. Okay, so with all of, the, of this knowledge, um, let's now take a look at creating an underlit sunset. Um, and for this, I will load one of the preset um, materials, doesn't matter which one, let's just take that one. Um, and something that I want to uncheck, by the way, is auto scale clouds. Uh, that's a setting that I forgot to mention yesterday. So auto scale clouds is a setting that was introduced in version 2015. And you will notice as long as this thing is checked, when I move the entire cloud layer up or down, um, the clouds themselves um, have the same shape. So they don't get smaller even though they're now further away from the camera. So auto scale clouds always retains the same scale of the clouds no matter how high they are in the sky. There's one difference though, and that is moving the cloud uh, down towards the ground. And if you do that, they get smaller and smaller until they uh, completely disappear. So um, some of you might probably have had trouble creating ground fog because they um, placed a cloud layer on the ground of their scene and they didn't get any sort of clouds. And that's because the clouds were scaled to a size of 0%. So personally, I don't like this behavior because I think if I move a cloud layer higher up in the sky, I also expect the clouds to get smaller. So I uncheck this now, and now you can see that the clouds are actually getting smaller. So um, my recommendation, uncheck that thing. Um, okay, so let's uh, move the sun in front of our camera, so at zero degree. And I will um, reduce the setting to something more reasonable. So let's use a density of 100% probably, or maybe even less. And let's increase the sharpness a bit. And um, maybe add a little bit more opacity in here. And also let's add a little more ambient light so that we get a better, better light distribution between light and shadow. So we can now see that we have some nice color bleeding between um, the white edges of the cloud and the shadow areas. Um, so there's one very important setting and this one is called clouds and isotropy. So um, when light enters any material, whether it's a cloud or, or um, whether it's like a wooden table where most of the light is absorbed, doesn't matter. Um, but any kind of material or substance either transports the light forwards or backwards. So backwards towards the viewer or forwards into the direction that is already uh, traveling. And clouds are a medium that always transport light forwards. That's, um, yeah, a physical law. And clouds and isotropy now changes the direction into which the light that is um, scattered inside the cloud, um, yeah, moves. So everything, um, any positive value scatters the light forwards and any negative value scatters the light backwards. And um, this results in a different light distribution within the clouds. So the default value when you load a cloud layer or an atmosphere is 0.38. And this causes the clouds to be a lot grayer than um, with the setting that I had. So let's reset the um, sun for a moment. Yes, and you know, can now see that the clouds are pretty gray, which is the default in, in photometric atmospheres. And by moving that down, we can see that the, the gray intensity is reduced um, up here and the clouds become brighter. Um, I'll also reset this to zero. 
And again, let's set this to a higher value. Yep. So the clouds become more gray and uh, we have a different like light and shadow distribution in the clouds. And this is extremely important for sunsets and you'll see why in a second. So let's again set the, the sun in front of the clouds and set it to a low angle so that we're at, um, yeah, like sunset or sunrise. I'll actually set this to, to zero entirely. Um, or maybe, no, we still want to see that for the clouds anisotropy. Um, so I'll, I just removed the haze and the glowing of the haze around the sun so that we get the pure effect from the sun. Um, so I will check God rays now and this will cause the clouds to actually cast shadows into the atmosphere. And this produces nice looking God rays in here. And actually a God ray is not a sun ray that um, falls through the clouds. A God ray is um, the contrast between light and the shadows that are cast from the clouds into the atmosphere. And contrary to popular opinion, you, don't, you do not need um, haze and glow amount to produce God rays. As you can see right now, both are set to 0%. So we have neither haze nor glowing haze in the scene. The, the effect that we're seeing right here is really only the result of the shadows that the clouds cast into the atmosphere. So the intensity of the shadows is controlled with that shadow density slider down here. The maximum is 100%. And this means that both um, the scene itself gets darker, obviously, um, because the shadow is now a lot darker. But it also means that the contrast between the bright uh, sunlit parts and the dark shadows increased and now the god rays are a lot more visible. That said, um, it produces unrealistic results in most cases. So I like to use values between um, 30, uh, t um, 10 and, and 30%, which is a more subtle effect, but which looks a lot more realistic to me at least. Um, yeah, so that's what causes God rays. And now if I increase that cloud anisotropy to a value like this, um, I think we need to get the sun a little more visible or increase the decay amount. Yes, okay. So I just increased the amount of red light in our atmosphere. And if you take a look at these parts in here, they are now really, really overexposed and are, are truly glowing around the sun. And this is caused by um, that cloud's anisotropy setting that we set here. So a value around uh, 0 0.75, 0 0.76 causes these clouds to appear very, very bright when um, lit from behind by the sun. Let me set this to a lower value and you will see the difference immediately. Yeah, the overexposed bright spots are gone. And that's one of the secrets to creating one of these elusive underlit sunset scenes in view. You need to um, use clouds and isotropy around um, 76%. And um, this will create that glowing effect. The second um, secret to creating um, an underlit sunset is that the sun needs to be at a very low angle so that the clouds are lit from, from uh, below. And this is around zero or even minus one degrees. And right now we're not seeing much. Um, everything is simply turned red because the sun is so low. And uh, this is because our decay mean altitude covers the entire height of our sky. So um, even the bright parts that would normally be the underlit parts are covered so intensively in red that they are not bright enough to create that um, underlit sunset effect. So let's decrease our decay mean altitude so that we get some sort of blue parts back in our sky. And now you clearly see what happened. We have a nice underlit sunset, which, um, is caused by the low um, angle of the sun and by the clouds and isotropy of 76% uh, and by decreasing the decay mean altitude. And uh, we could now, um, for example, 
add a darker bluish ambient color to increase the contrast of our scene. And we could also increase the decay amount to make things um, yeah, more reddish. And um, now we have a nice dark contrast between these glowing bright parts and um, the red parts of the rest. And the lower the density of the clouds, um, the more light can scatter in them. So if I lower the density, we, can, we will see that we get more and more um, yeah, light scattering in the, in the dark, formerly dark areas of the cloud. And let's, um, I don't know, use a higher value for opacity to create a more stark contrast between the lit parts and uh, the, the parts in the shadows. And you can now also see that um, that blue ambient color that we used here um, was uh, used to color the, the shadow parts um, quite strongly. And of course, we could increase the effect if we um, increased the altitude of the clouds so that they are at a different angle um, compared to the sun, so that more of the clouds is lit from underneath. Let's increase the cover a bit. Uh, that was a little too much. Remove some opacity and remove some ambient lighting as well because there's not that much ambient light present in a sunset. Yes. So we could simply play around with this until we get our desired result. Um, but yeah, this is the secret to creating an underlit sunset scene similar to what you see here in my PowerPoint presentation. The um, the glowing parts were created by that um, clouds and isotropy. And then I reduced the height of the decay, which you can see because the sky behind the clouds is still blue. And then I simply played around with exposure settings until I got that contrasty effect. Okay, any questions so far? I see Karen's question on uh, that drop down menu. I'll come to that in a moment. Any other questions before I tackle that question? Mm -hmm. The general order of cloud creation done. Okay, um, I'd say build your shapes first, the atmosphere last. And I always start with using um, cover density and opacity at 100% and sharpness and um, feathers and detail amount at zero. And um, this means that you start with a uniform shading and then you can gradually, um, yeah, improve the scattering of the light in your clouds until you like um, the overall scattering appearance. Then you can decide uh, with how many shadows you want to have in your cloud, more or less. And once you're satisfied with the light distribution and the amount of shadows in your cloud, um, then you can add um, a little bit of sharpness into there until you're satisfied with how sharp your cloud looks. And once you're done with that, you can start to add, to bring ambient light into your cloud um, so that the cloud itself takes on the color of the atmosphere and blends in nicely. So that would be my general idea, create your, your cloud shapes and then start by adjusting density first, then introduce shadows with opacity then add the, uh, the amount of sharpness that you want and finally blend the cloud with ambient lighting into the atmosphere. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, so about Karen's question, um, let's take a look at this drop down menu. Um, so the shadows on clouds, um, oh, sorry, let me uncheck God rays for a moment. Um, so, when you check God rays, then the clouds are casting volumetric shadows into the atmosphere, which is similar to activating um, the volumetric option on any light in your scene. Um, there's also the option to, act, to activate volumetric sunlight. When you activate volumetric sunlight, you don't need to activate God rays because they are um, a natural um, consequence of activating volumetric sunlight. The difference between God rays only and volumetric sunlight is that um, if you have other objects in your scene, such as a cube or, or a plant or anything like that, then they will also um, cast 
shadows into the atmosphere so you get that nice shafts of light coming down in a forest for example but it makes no difference for clouds it's only a matter of whether you want sun rays um, um, shooting in your scene from the sun that's rising behind a mountain for example um, so this has nothing to do with clouds only it only defines whether other objects can also create god rays or not um, and projected shadows on clouds is actually um, more relevant for um, scenes with um, more than one cloud layer in a scene. So uh, let, me, let me load another cloud layer into the scene, a second one, and for example, that one, and we'll place that one higher than the first one. Yes, and now obviously the entire the entire lower cloud layer got darker as well. That's still below our first one, so something like that. Okay, so our clouds are not now a lot darker because this layer now casts shadows onto the lower layer. And this is also slower to render. So if you don't need this, you can say no shadows on clouds and the lower cloud layer will not receive any shadows from the cloud layers that are above it. Um, so um, by using the combination of um, calculating shadows of all cloud layers or only of the lowest one, and by uh, using a god rays on or off, you can create many awesome lighting effects, but also at the expense of longer render times. Um, about changing the cloud scale. Um, yesterday I said that you can switch um, all of the functions here from world coordinates to local coordinates. And when local coordinates are checked, then, you, then um, the functions are influenced by the cloud scale. So if you, want, if you have, I don't know, three, three functions active in here, and you want to make all three functions three times bigger at once, then you could either go into the function editor and adjust the scale of all the nodes of all these three functions in there manually, or you can simply use the scale setting of, um, of uh, the material in here and uh, set it to two maybe, and this will make everything twice as big compared to what it was before. Um, but this only works when local coordinates are checked. When you use work coordinates, then the scale has no influence. So let me show that again with the big cumulus. I'll set this to two. Yes, and now the clouds became really huge. So um, it's just a faster way of making your entire cloud material smaller or bigger. Any further questions? Okay, so Heinz is asking um, which um, setting is the most reasonable for using that quality boost function. Um, are, are you referring to that quality boost in here or to that quality boost um, here in the cloud material? Also, welchen von beiden uh, Reglern meinst du, Heinz? Den im Material oder den im Atmosphären-Editor? in here. Okay, so Heinz is referring to that one in the atmosphere editor. Um, well, it, the, the use of haze and fog causes lots of noise in the scene. So if I were to increase the haze amount and check God rays um, and increase the glow amount probably, and let's raise the sun so that we have got rays in here. Um, that's too strong. Um, yes, you can already see that there's now a lot of noise in the scene 
which is uh, visible right here. And the only way to get rid of that noise is by increasing that quality boost. So there is no um, global recommendation as to what which value to use. It really depends on how much fog and haze you have in your scene and how noisy the scene looks. So um, you really have to play around with that and increase it until you get rid of the noise, but this will increase render times by an order of magnitude. Um, Karen, I'm always working in the cloud material for the most part. Um, the only difference is the shading in here. So the, the light scattering and the, the light distribution of the cloud is controlled only on uh, the cloud tab in the atmosphere editor. And the shapes of the clouds are um, created with all these functions down here. So the cloud material editor is for creating the shapes and the atmosphere editor is for lighting your clouds. So what about Cirrus cloud layers? Well, this is all a matter of um, creating um, the corresponding noise functions in here. Um, it's rather difficult, I have to admit. Um, I'm still working on the perfect solution myself, um, but the, um, the secret to creating Cirrus uh, is definitely to use a, 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 um, a suitable fractal and then to add turbulence, turbulence to that fractal. So um, let me do that right now. Um, there's the turbulence ca category with three different turbulence versions and turbulence needs to be connected to the origin of the noise. So the origin is basically um, the position in the scene where, from where a view starts to um, produce the noise. So there are also noises that are not covering the sky entirely. For example, there are noises that create a single sphere in the sky. And so with the origin, um, you can enter coordinates in here and this will move um, the spherical noise to um, a different place in the scene. So you're sort of offsetting the, the world origin for that single node, so to speak. And if you replace that origin with a turbulence, then you are displacing that noise and you can, um, yeah, um, create wavy patterns. And this is definitely necessary for uh, creating cirrus clouds. So the strength is controlled with the amplitude. Let's just try a stronger one and you can now see how things start to get distorted. So um, there is no secret recipe to creating cirrus clouds. Um, it's really a matter of trying out a lot of different noises and um, add turbulence to each of them. Okay, yes, Karen, it doesn't matter if you enter the function editor from here in case you're using a function or whether you click on that preview. It's the same, at least in, in this version and in, in view 2016. Um, so let's say I want to use that sharpness modulation. Um, if I click this way, I am also back into the function and you can see that we also have the sharpness modulation output that I just added by um, activating that button in here. In older versions, and older means anything older than 2016, when you entered the function through this preview, all that was visible was that. All the other modulations fu modulation functions are not visible in older versions when you enter the function editor here. They're separated. So the only way to see um, the functions that you built in here in older versions is to click on um, on uh, that button and then you will uh, see all the modulation functions. It's like two different places in older versions and uh, with 2016, they all consolidated um, the density production and the modulation function in one place. And I guess that's why I always go into the function editor with these buttons because I'm so used to it from older versions. But as I said, from 2016 and on, doesn't matter if you enter um, the function editor through that preview or through these modulation functions. Okay, if there are no further questions, then I'd say let's have a look at um, 
the Mimetus clouds that I wanted to show you yesterday. So I'm going to load the atmosphere in here and let's have a look at uh, that cloud formation. So um, it's a rather rare um, weather phenomenon and I chose that one as an example scene because I thought, well, it looks rather um, otherworldly and it's not something that you see uh, every day. So um, why not give that one a try and see how you could approach something similar in view. Um, so let's take a look at these different pictures for a moment. We can see that the underside of uh, Mimetus clouds have that kind of bubbly shape. So if I were to give you a hint on how to approach that cloud design in view, and I say we need to um, create an irregular bottom or underside of our cloud layer, who has an idea which uh, feature to use for that? If you want to make the bottom um, irregular. Mm -hmm. Filters, ah, displays, okay. Yes, both, both is a good idea. Um, I think Uwe nailed it a little more clearly. So we want to displace the underside of the cloud layer and the underside is the altitude of our cloud layer. So the function to make the altitude um, irregular to displace it is the altitude offset that I showed you yesterday. Um, so um, what I used here was um, the altitude offset um, function and then I um, used a simple fractal of a Voronoi fractal. So a Voronoi creates bubbly shapes and I wanted the shapes to be rather round and not so um, Let's switch that to photographic so that we get to see a better contrast. Yeah, I wanted the shapes to be um, not that rough. So I turned down the roughness. And because the bubbles that um, Verona creates go down, uh, go up, sorry, and we need uh, them to go down, I then inverted that noise. And then I used it to, to displace the underside of the cloud layer with that um, um, bubbly Voronoi noise. And again, the strength of the displacement is controlled with the altitude variation slider. So the moment you use um, the altitude offset, then the slider has a totally different function. So it's not adding that towers to the top anymore, but it instead regulates the displacement strength. And after um, displacing the, uh, the underside of the cloud layer, I also um, simply connected the same shape to the density. And in order to create some nice light scattering um, in the places where there was a little bit more space between uh, that bubbly thing. And finally, um, here I have um, a sine wave pattern. So let me um, disconnect that for a moment and connect it to a sine wave. And let's have a look at our preview in here. So um, I said that the sine wave should only occur into the x direction. So I said y and c to zero. And now we have a lot of lines, um, a line pattern basically that covers the sky. And I said, well, I want to control the contrast of our bubbles um, by that line pattern. So I um, connected um, the, the sine wave to our gain, which is the contrast. And so in all those places where it goes down to minus one, I wanted the contrast to be to be lower. And um, in between, I wanted the contrast to be stronger. And um, so I said, well, the minimum contrast that I want to have is uh, 0 0.3, which I just got from, from uh, trial and error. And the maximum contrast that looked good to me was uh, 0 0.6. And so I said, let's take that noise and turn minus one into the minimum contrast of points, point 0.3 and one, so the highest uh, points into the maximum contrast of 0 0.62. And uh, let's control the contrast of the noise with that. And well, this resulted in um, 
this resulted in um, Mematis clouds that have uh, at least here some sort of line appearance. It's really subtle, but if I were to um, remove this, um, you see that it looks um, a little more organic, um, but I wanted to have uh, this line appearance. And that's the entire secret to how I created that cloud layer. Just a few notes, and you could simply omit um, the sine wave and the map filter if you if you don't want um, to use that one. Um, and for fine tuning, I um, morphed the shapes a little and added just a tiny bit of turbulence to the bubbles to make them a little less uh, regular. So you see, I disconnect the turbulence, and now they look a little more uniform and this simply um, morphed them a tiny bit. So all of this is optional detail work. The entire secret was finding the right noise, inverting it to make the bubbles go down instead of up and displacing the cloud layer. And about the filter that you mentioned, um, actually I didn't change the filter um, because due to the displacement of the bottom, I didn't need the clouds to fade in softly. But of course you can always use the filter and uh, make the clouds fade in at the bottom as well. So um, you can see that since the cloud layer is already quite thin due to the um, displacement, um, fading in would uh, make the clouds really thin, so that's why I didn't touch the filter in here. But generally speaking, yes, you could use the filter for a soft fade in at the bottom. Okay, so how would I make the clouds patchy? Um, well, I would blend the density with another noise, so uh, with a mask, for example. Um, okay, we could give that a try. So let's say I want to blend um, between having no clouds in the sky, so um, 100% transparency and having the Mematis clouds. So as I said, a value of minus one means 100% transparency, so we have no clouds. So I want to plan between a value of minus one and um, our clouds in here. And for blending between two things, we need a blender node, which can be found in the combiners group. So let's connect our bubbly noise um, and our full transparency. And usually you can, you have a slider that regulates how to, uh, how to blend between both things. So whether you want to blend more towards the first input or towards the second input. And the great thing is that you can replace this blending ratio with something else. So for example, um, let's create another um, noise. And this time I'll be using a Perlin noise, and let's make that bigger, for example, 500 meters. And let's have a look at the values. Okay, so um, we can see that we have values between sort of minus um, 0 0.5 and plus 0.5. Uh, so the noise does not have the full contrast. I want to increase the contrast. So I will add a filter and brightness and contrast node. I don't want to increase the brightness, only the contrast. Noise nodes don't have a gain slider in, compared to fractal. So um, that's why I need a second node. So let's increase the contrast to about two. Uh, that was too strong. We can take a look and we can now see that it goes up until 1.5. We want to have a maximum of one. Yes, that looks better. And um, now we need to um, make sure that our noise um, does uh, uh, outputs only values between zero and one because the blender needs values between zero, which means use um, input zero and one use input one. So I will transform the values with a map filter. So again, our noise goes from minus one to one, sort of. And um, so let's change minus one to one and turn it into zero to one and connect that to the ratio and result to the density. And maybe I will increase the brightness a little bit and I'll cut off anything 
outside of that. And let's increase the scale of our noise, maybe even two kilometers or five kilometers to make these areas really big. Yes, and now we have um, patches of clouds in the sky. So we blended between no clouds and our bubbly clouds and we used that gradient as a mask. So if you want to, to mask something in the function editor, use a blender and connect your mask to the ratio and make sure that um, you, you remap the values to from zero to one. If you use filters to squeeze the tops, Um, I would use the height modulation to squeeze the tops, Karen, uh, sorry, Cass, um, because um, the height modulation only displaces the top of the cloud layer and um, the altitude uh, modulation that we're using displaces both the top and the bottom of uh, the cloud layer at the same time. So if we want to uh, squeeze the top of the cloud layer, what I would do is to... Um, at height modulation and then I'd um, displace the height with um, yeah the opposite version of the noise so the non-inverted version which means we're undoing the displacement at the top of the cloud layer so I just removed um, the bubbles at the top of the cloud layer by using um, the opposite version of the noise which cancels out the top displacement Um, yes, Don, you can rotate uh, the sine wave um, noise. There is actually a rotation node in the function editor, which is to be found under math, vector operations, rotation and twist. So we simply connect this to our sine wave so that we um, uh, yeah, rotate it accordingly. And now you have a vector C rotation, which is around the top axis. And uh, now we could rotate the noise arbitrarily, arbitrarily into any direction we want. You're welcome. Okay, so um, that's about it for the Mimetis clouds. Any questions um, so far um, on that topic? If not, then we'll um, go over the questions from yesterday, the remaining ones. Okay, apparently no more questions. Um, then I'd like to go um, and cover um, some of the questions from yesterday. So uh, let me have a look. Where did I save that one? Yeah, there. Okay. So I think Pierre asked me yesterday uh, whether it's possible to create um, rainbow colors um, around the clearing clearings or, or holes of... Um, um, of a cloud material and well it's perfectly possible actually so this is the top camera um, again I'll switch to that photometric filter for better contrast and you can see that the entire cloud is white um, except for the parts that are located close to a clearing and um, that was actually pretty easy to do. Yesterday, I thought it, it uh, was much more complicated, but it's actually not that hard to do. So you can control the color of the clouds and also the sky and sun ambient color if you check force ambient color with a function as well. So instead of using one single color, um, you can also use color gradients. And all that I did was I took the shapes um, of that cloud layer Let's have a look. So um, as always, the cloud um, layer is somewhere in between minus one as the lowest point and plus one as the highest point. Um, and then the color, uh, then I created a color map. And so 
the color map also goes from minus one, which would be the lowest points and the places where you'd create a clearing in a cloud to one, the highest point um, in a cloud. And so I said, well, the low points that are considered to be a clearing or full transparency anyways should be colored in rainbow colors and everything else should be white. So I simply um, created uh, rainbow colors and moved them um, around here until I got that kind of result that I wanted. So it's um, pretty easy to do. Mm -hmm. um, well, um, uh, Nanda, we're going to cover MetaClouds um, in just a few moments, including the new features. Um, when to use multiple cloud layers instead of a single cloud layer. Um, well, that simply depends on uh, the look of your scene. Um, personally, I love using multiple cloud layers in theory, but it's of course a lot more uh, to render, so scenes get slower. Um, the thing is that clouds themselves can always be at one um, height. So when you work with a single cloud layer, all of the clouds will always be uh, somewhere in between our cloud layer um, bounding box in here. Um, and for realistic scenes, you always um, have clouds that are um, lower than others and higher than others. If you go outside on a stormy day, then you will see several layers of clouds um, scattered across the sky. And that's when you need to use multiple cloud layers because it's um, not possible or very difficult at least to create um, several clouds um, at different altitudes. So uh, we can give that one a try. So um, I'll simply reset our rainbow function in the meantime, so that we're back to white. And let's decrease the height a little so that we get to see more. And now let's create another cloud layer and let's make that one really low at 200 meters, for example. Reduce the cover and make it really fluffy with less details and and I'll color that red just for the time being so that we get get a better view of what's going on in here yes and we now have um, lower clouds let's move that one up so that we have a bigger contrast and let's increase the scale. Yes, so um, using multiple cloud layers adds more and more detail to your scene and can create um, quite convincing atmospheres. And um, don't forget that you can also uh, limit clouds to, to a zone simply by activating limit cloud to zone. And then you can um, yeah, move the cloud zone to any place you want to um, make sure that the clouds themselves are not covering the entire sky, which is what I just did with the upper cloud layer. But I actually wanted to do it with the lower one. Um, so let's limit that one to a zone and increase the size of the zone. Yeah, so now we have uh, only uh, um, at a specific portion of the scene, a couple of low hanging clouds. Okay, um, I'll go through the questions one by one. Having more than one sun, um, a sun is nothing more than a directional light. So you can simply add a second directional light into the scene and this will act as a second sun. So it's not visible at the moment due to all the clouds. Um, yeah, but theoretically that should be possible with a second sun. Um, thunderheads and anvils. Um, that's something that's incredibly complex to create. Um, it's possible, but um, it's a very, very advanced technique. Um, actually, if we still have a few minutes time, Karen, at the end, I can show you um, a product that I've been working on that allows to do exactly that. 
Um, Aurora Borealis. Um, again, it's, it comes down to the same technique. You would um, create your clouds with a um, corresponding noise function. So um, let me give that one a try. And again, I'll show you how to build that empty cloud layer as a preset um, before I forget it. Um, so let's load, sorry, that empty cloud layer. Uh, where is it? Okay. Um, so Aurora Borealis without checking any reference pictures um, are usually like something that is a little bit smeared around the, the sky and which has certain green, blue, and magenta colors. So I will try to add a smeared, or a smeared, I don't know how to pronounce it, <laughs> um, fractal to our scene. And a suitable for, or one for that is the grainy fractal. So let's use a position input. And let's mm, reduce the roughness of that grainy fractal. And let's make it bigger. And let's have a look at the contrast. The contrast is not high enough at the moment. So let's increase it, connect it to our density. Um, and maybe we need some roughness. And now I'll increase the distortion. Filter steepness looks good as well. This is just me playing around right now. So um, I'd want to have a th very thin cloud. So let's reduce the height. And let's reduce the cover. Maybe a little too strong. Um, and I think we need to make that thing smaller in scale. Or maybe bigger, I'm not sure. So you just have to play around with, with the settings um, to create some smeared around volumes. That one looks a little better to me. Um, let's increase the contrast a bit and let's limit that cloud to a zone. Again, let's increase the size of the zone and move it in front of the camera. Let's make the zone even bigger. And now I would um, edit the volumetric color and use a color map. And let's edit the colors into something that resembles an Aurora Borealis. So I would have, of course, to check reference pictures for the exact colors. This is just a rough try. And now let's say our noise is supposed to control the coloring of our Aurora. And now let's connect our noise. And yes, the problem now is that the different colors only occur in the places where we just removed the clouds due to the coverage setting. So I would need to um, edit the color map a little. So let's move that one more towards green. More towards the places that are left. Yes, yeah, so you'd have to play, play around with it. Um, of course, it doesn't look um, like a true Aurora Borealis at the moment, even when I decrease the density. Um, but nonetheless, I think that's the way you would tackle that, that kind of project. Okay, I'm reading Nando's question now. Okay, um, Nando, you're referring to using an HDRI. Um, that's uh, possible by using environment mapping, um, which will switch the atmosphere to, um, yeah, an HDRI atmosphere. However, I am unsure whether you can 
you can keep clouds in there or not. No, you can't. So there's no way um, to actually um, use both an HDR I and um, a volumetric cloud. So you'd have to combine them in post. Okay, we have homogeneous semi-opaque layer. Yes, the dark gray outlines um, for uh, recreating um, cumulus clouds. Unfortunately, that's something that's really difficult to do in view um, because the clouds don't have um, multiple scattering um, yet. And this is an effect that's typically um, uh, observed through um, yeah, subsurface scattering clouds. So you'd have to imitate uh, that effect. Um, so let me show that cloud again. Um, you can always go into the cloud and darken the color manually to a dark gray. And now we can increase the ambient lighting to a stronger value. Um, and see whether we can we can get um, our details back, but apparently we can't. Maybe the gray color that I chose was too gray after all. So maybe let's try a lighter gray. Yes. So and now you see that we have that gray color um, at the edges of the cloud, and. Um, Nonetheless, the ambient lighting that we um, added here brightened the cloud up, and now we can add some opacity back to to um, darken the bottom of the clouds. So you can play around with a combination of um, gray volumetric color and extreme ambient lighting to get such a um, silver lining and, and gray effect. Um, okay, um, Umgebungsbild und Effekte. Um, Nando, da müsste ich nachschauen, ehrlich gesagt, im Handbuch, weil ich kenne die deutschen Bezeichnungen nicht. Um, können wir gerne außerhalb des Webinars mal erklären, dann schaue ich es mir mit dir an. I just told Nando that I'd have to look up the German translations for the things that he mentioned outside of the webinar. I'll get in touch with him. Okay. So um, now we're um, about to tackle uh, planetary clouds for just a moment. Um, before we do that, let me show you how I created that empty cloud layer because that was a question at the beginning of the webinar. Um, so an empty cloud layer for me means that it has no shapes and that it has full coverage and full density and opacity so that I can start to um, yeah, experiment with um, shapes and shading. So I set everything to zero except for cover density and opacity. And I set a default altitude of one kilometer and height of one, so that's just the starting point. And uh, shadow density also doesn't matter at the moment. Then I reset the filter by loading that full filter in here, which means we have no influence of that filter whatsoever. And I only um, activate that filter as one of the final steps once my cloud shapes are done so that I can then fade in the clouds at the bottom and, and at the top smoothly. Um, and then I reset all of the functions in here, make sure that we don't have any function connected whatsoever. And I uncheck auto scale cloud. So what we just ended up with is basically a plain virgin cloud material without any kind of function activated. And we also have no internal noise added. So detail amount is set to zero and all the base shading settings of density opacity and ambient lighting are set to 100%. And that's um, my empty cloud layer preset that I saved so that I can start from scratch when designing a new cloud. Um, Okay, so let's take a look at the large scale density for a moment. Um, in the uh, view options, file options, you can activate the spherical scene. And this will um, turn 
all the terrains and your uh, ground plane into um, yeah an actual planet. So if I zoom out in the OpenGL views, we can see that we now oops, have um, an actual planet. So let me move out the camera and let's look down at our planet. That's probably too high. Yeah, so now we have a planet. And if I hide the clouds, we can now see the thickness of the atmosphere. So our green crown and uh, everything else that you see here is, um, yeah, is our uh, sky uh, mean altitude. So the thickness of 8.8 .8 kilometers and the sky fog and haze as well. So um, let's, let's add detail amount into our cloud so that we get a basic cloud shape. And we can already see that we're not seeing much because the clouds are, ah, I forgot to hide, um, to show them, but anyways. Um, so now we have detail amount in here. Let's try an extreme value of 300%. So our preview shows that we do in fact have very elaborate cloud shapes, but they are so tiny that they appear um, as noise down here. Even I set that thing to 100%, it's still a lot of noise. So that's why there's also that large scale um, density um, tab on here. And in here you can load planetary cloud density maps. If you Google for something like that, um, you will find um, maps on the internet daily. And uh, there's an example map that ships with the software. And that's this one. It's an 8K grayscale image. And this is similar to editing the density. Um, and well, this will simply again, make the cloud material fully transparent in black parts and um, opaque in white parts. And it can be used to, crea to create um, clouds that wrap 360 degree around a planet. And you can um, specify how strongly that map is blended with the density functions that you create here or with the detail amount um, by using that uh, influence on density slider. So if I set this to 100% and let's lower the sun so that we get a better contrast, um, we can now clearly see the, the shapes of that planetary cloud map. What we also see is that um, it looks pixelated. So 8K is not a sufficient enough um, for uh, creating great looking planetary clouds because that blocky thing that we're seeing here is actually, yeah, a pixel, a black or white pixel of our um, texture map. Um, there is also the option to displace the height of the cloud layer similar to using height modulation and this is done with influence on height. And now that we did that, we just um, removed the entire clouds um, an all black part. So we displaced our cloud layer to a height of 0%. And well, um, all white parts have, have, have a remaining height of 100%. And let's increase the height a little more so that we get uh, yeah, a more 3D-ish look. And that limit wall effect is sort of a Gaussian blur that's applied to the map so that the sharp transitions between black and white parts um, are a little less harsh, which um, can be seen with, uh, if we rendered this um, in a big way, uh, in a full resolution. So um, yeah, the large scale density is basically a texture map that is wrapped 360 degrees with spherical projection around the planet and which is then blended with the density production shapes that you, that you created here. And again, uh, Nando, I created that planetary um, scene by going to file and options. And then I checked spherical scene. And I also said that I wanted the ground plane and all the terrains that I had in the scene to be converted into um, spherical planetary terrains that wrap around the planet seamlessly. Um, so it's just um, a matter of uh, checking these two boxes and then you're back to um, a normal scene. Okay, so I'll move the camera down again and let's remove our cloud layer and let's edit 
our camera rotation so that we can see the sky. Okay, um, doing a planet like Mars would simply mean um, using a terrain that looks like Mars, Frank, and then checking a spherical scene. Yes, Frank, you can animate the camera um, from, all, from space all the way to the ground, but I guess you'd need a render farm for that. <laughs> um, regarding the small wispy clouds at the edges of a cloud mass, um, again, that's a matter of finding the right fractal um, to use for your clouds or combining different fractals. So there's no secret recipe for any kind of cloud shape. You simply need to play around with fractals until you have a shape that you like and that resembles what you're going for. Um, yeah, okay, and I'll also have a look at Karen's artwork regarding the Thunderhead. Ah, oh, nice, okay. So I guess you um, use several cloud layers to create the Thunderhead, probably. That's definitely a way to do it. Um, the glow around uh, spherical planets, um, depends on uh, the, the glow intensity that you set in the atmosphere editor and on your, your atmospheric settings in here. So you need to play around with haze and glow uh, um, to create that atmospheric glow. Okay, so um, there's one question left from yesterday um, and that one is about animation. Um, so, before we go to MetaClouds, which will be the very final topic for the webinar, let's have a look at how to animate clouds. So again, I'll be loading um, an empty cloud layer. And um, so let's add some detail amount in there. And let's reduce the cover. And here we have a couple of nice looking clouds. Okay. Um, so for any cloud that uses that built-in detail amount noise, animation is really simple. You can indicate the direction in which the cloud should move, so the wind direction, so to speak, by using that um, compass in here. Um, and you can indicate the speed at which uh, the cloud should move per, um, I guess it's per hour, I'm not sure. Um, and this will simply move the cloud across the sky. Alternatively, you can, of course, always move the cloud layer manually if you are using local coordinates uh, with the gizmos and simply um, yeah, move it with your mouse through the scene. And so you'd have to keyframe, uh, create a keyframe for um, the first uh, frame of your animation and the last frame. And in the first frame, you set the velocity and the direction and the cloud will also move automatically. Um, and then there's the rate of change. So the rate of change actually creates that cloud morphing effect. Um, so what the rate of change is actually doing is it changes uh, the origin of the cloud. So it moves the starting point of the noise um, away from the scene origin. And this looks like as if the cloud was evolving over time. So you can set the speed of that um, rate of change in here. And again, this will make the clouds animate automatically. However, these settings are only valid for the detail amount. So if you create um, a cloud with your own fractals, then you need to build that animation manually. And I'll show you how in just a few mouse clicks. So again, let's um, add any fractal that creates our cloud shapes. Doesn't matter what, uh, which one, it's all about the basic idea. Um, and okay, we're apparently using world coordinates now. Uh, sorry, local coordinates because everything's so big, but that's no problem. Um, yeah, I'll just reduce the cover so that we can see uh, something. Okay. Um, so now let's say we want to make this material um, change over time. The rate of change slider is not going to have any effect in this case. So we need to um, rebuild that rate of change manually in the function editor. And I said the cloud um, development 
is done by changing the coordinates of the origin. So inside the material, you have a time input and the time input returns the current frame of the animation. So if we are at frame one, it will output a value of one. If we are on frame two, it will output a value of two, etc. So each new frame of the animation will produce a new number in here. And so we simply need to take that number, convert it into a vector and control the origin with that. So in the first frame of the scene, um, we'd have an origin of one, one, one. In the second uh, frame, we'd have an origin of two, 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 three, 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 et cetera. And so this would move the entire noise um, uh, really fast. Um, and that, uh, that uh, makes it look as if the clouds are evolving. And how do you convert um, a number into a vector? This is done with the math group, vector operations, and um, offset separate parameters. So first we need to extract our starting point for the origin. This is done by clicking connect parameter. And now we simply got our coordinates X, Y, and Z um, as a separate node. And so we are moving these coordinates to our new place. We are offsetting that by X, Y, and Z. And we're, we want to control the offset along X, Y, and Z with time input. And then we'll connect the output to the origin. And now each, with each frame of our animation, the, the coordinates of the origin um, change. And this looks at, like uh, the cloud is evolving. And I can uh, show you a test animation that I did a few um, weeks ago uh, with a product of mine. And this is a combination of um, animating the cover slider and the rate of change for a cumulonimbus cloud. I'll replay, replay it. And this is all done with um, the technique that I just showed you. I'm offsetting the origin with the time input. Of course, there are a couple of more calculations involved, but that's the basic idea. So this way you can animate any cloud material, even if the rate of change slider is not going to work when you're not using the detail amount. Um, that depends on, um, you don't have to use um, a small render region over and over. That's something that I only do for um, defining the final render settings regarding quality and noise removal. So for um, creating the entire cloudscape, I usually do a small preview render of the entire scene. And for um, then checking out the quality um, settings for, for the rendering, um, I usually do a crop and see whether I can remove noise in there efficiently. Okay, so now um, let's uh, go to the very final topic of the webinar and these are meta clouds. So meta clouds are standalone clouds that are made out of spherical primitives. You can load them um, with, uh, on the left toolbar by going to that um, add meta cloud um, box and load any of these presets in here. So let's choose that one. And you can uh, see when you expand that meta cloud on uh, to the right in the world browser that it's made out of countless spheres, also visible in the OpenGL uh, preview. The problem, in my opinion, with meta clouds is that they don't look good. Um, they always retain their bubbly shape and look no matter what you do. Um, so I try to avoid them whenever I can. Um, Meta clouds are uh, the, re the replacement for our cloud layer window. So again, Meta clouds also use, um, let's turn off auto scale, also use um, that um, world standard cloud material tied to the scene origin. And they act as a window into that um, cloud material. So um, you can see that you have a lot less settings compared to um, a classic cloud layer. You only have control a function for the volumetric color and a function for um, the density production. So again, if I were to edit this and add a 
um, rectangular noise, then we'd have a rectangularly filled meta cloud. Nonetheless, you always get that bubbly appearance. Um, the cloud settings tab cont contain all the settings that you know from the atmosphere editor, such as density, opacity, cover, etc. Um, and um, yeah, the shapes right here are only created through the detail amount. So if I remove that, all we are left with is the classical pure um, look of the spheres. And uh, even with that detail amount back in there, um, I have the feeling that you s can still see the invisible spheres in the background, um, which is clearly visible right here and right here and over here. I mean, you can select individual spheres in a meta cloud and move them to another place and rescale them and s stretch them, etc. But they will always remain spheres. When you start to reduce the cover, um, you actually um, lose uh, kind of the bubbly shape, but what you're left is, uh, with is a cloud with lots of holes. So that's also not a good way to create um, a proper um, looking cumulonimbus cloud. Um, so honestly, I'm not, not such a huge fan of meta clouds. Um, however, there are um, a couple of new features in this new view version that make them really useful and which are absolutely great. So let's delete that um, meta cloud for a moment. And the first feature that I want to show you is the ability to convert any object into a meta cloud. So imagine you want, let's use a question mark. So let's say you want to create, I don't know, um, a tiger cloud from, from a tiger's head or so. Then you need to acquire the mesh of a tiger and load it into view. Um, where is my text actually? Okay, there it is. Let's make that really large. Hmm. Ah, there we are. Okay. Um, so let's let's say you want to use um, yeah an animal animal such as a tiger and want to create a, a cloud in the shape of it. Now it's a little too big, let's scale it down. Um, then you simply load it into your scene. And then you do a right click and go to convert to meta cloud and this dialog will open. And uh, with this dialog, you can now um, fill the entire um, mesh with spheres and this will create a meta cloud. So let's click apply. And we can now see that we have a meta cloud preview in here. And it's not visible because the material that was applied to it is really thin. Um, and of course, auto scale is active again. So let's turn off auto scale and make that cloud a little smaller. So it's a little bit of trial and error to figure out the correct scaling for, for the cloud. Um, and you can also see that the conversion was not so accurate. So let's increase the conversion accuracy, reapply. And it's going to take a little longer this time. Let's see if that one looks better or not. As I said, um, it's a little bit um, of trial and error. So um, I tried it prior to the webinar and um, it worked great. Unfortunately, I didn't remember the settings that I used. Um, so let's give it a try with a test render. Let's see if we have a visible cloud in there. Hmm. Okay, not really. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll give it another try. I think the cloud is too big actually. Um, oh yes, look at that, how big I made it. Um, it's 290 kilometers in height, which is a little, um, a little too big. <laughs> so that explains it why we're not seeing such a great result. Um, 
and why the interface is a little slow at the moment. So that was definitely my mistake. <laughs> um, I scaled it up way too much. So let's set this to two kilometers. Let's wait for a view to react. Okay, so what are we learning from this? Make sure you scale it correctly before you convert it to a cloud or it will be very resource intensive. Um, yeah, I think I'll simply remove it from the scene and add it again. So again, let's add another question mark, make it thick so that we get to see a lot of it. So this time I'm scaling it to a sensible size and where is it located? Somewhere near the origin. So let's um, zoom on it. And where's my camera actually? Let's see. Ah, so my camera is totally outside of any re uh, reasonable placement. Okay. So, here we are. Let's move that more towards the camera. I'm sorry for playing around with that so long. It seems I totally messed up the the zoom factor in the OpenGL views. <laughs> Still 800 kilometers away from the clouds. So I guess that's um, because we had that um, spherical scene before and I zoomed out really heavily so that we could see the planet and then I didn't zoom in properly again. So where is my question mark in here? Ah, okay. Give me a few seconds and then we're good to go. Ah, there we are. <laughs> okay, now we have a reasonable uh, sized question mark. And I'll convert that one again. This time I'll be using um, a button on the left toolbar, which is that one, convert to MetaCloud. Let's reset this to the defaults and click apply. Ah, and there we are. We have our nice question mark cloud. And um, yeah, so that's how the feature actually works. And you can simply play around with the settings to create more or less spheres and capture more or less detail um, for the mesh that you're generating. And the next uh, cool thing is that you can then save this cloud as an open VDB file. So um, open VDB um, is a uh, industry standard format for exchanging volumetric content between applications. So images um, consist, of, consist of pixels and OpenVDB consists of three-dimensional pixels, voxels, so to speak. So an OpenVDB is nothing more than a three-dimensional grid uh, similar to a cube that is made out of thousands of tiny cubes and one cube is a three-dimensional pixel, a voxel. So um, you can um, export um, that cloud now as an open VDB by doing a right click and choose an export object. And um, then I'll call this question mark dot open VDB. The number of steps is sort of, sort of the resolution um, of uh, the, the cloud. So the more steps, the more uh, voxels or cubes will be generated and the, the higher uh, the resolution of the cloud. Um, and multiple grids is therefore not only exporting um, the density data, but also the color in case we had um, a different volumetric color than only white and also the ambient lighting of the cloud. So by checking multiple grids, you can export one grid that contains the density information. So the shape, one that contains the, the ambient shading and one that contains the color shading. And these are simply options for um, exporting things um, in the way that your favorite application can read them. So some applications need 
um, a, a uniform grid that has the same amount of voxels along X, Y, and Z. Some uh, need a non-uniform grid. So just look up uh, the, the kind of um, file options that your preferred application can actually read. And you can also um, decide whether you want to export the, the coordinates in world space with the, the cloud or whether you want to center the cloud on origin. And export as float again is just another uh, um, option for, for some applications. For example, I have Cinema 4D and Cinema 4D can only read files that were exported as float. And if you click export, then the cloud is being exported. And this also works for cloud layers. So um, I'll uh, do a quick cloud layer creation and show what that export looks like. Again, let's add an empty cloud layer. I'll be moving really fast through this one. So I want to create um, uh, uh, so something similar to what we had yesterday with the billowy shapes. So let's add a simple fractal, a position input, and connect that one. And I'm working in real world coordinates. That's good. And let's make this a little rougher and switch the noise to Voronoi, which is good for that billowy noise. Make sure our Voronoi outputs all values from minus one to one. So let's decrease the contrast a little bit. Yes, now we are um, somewhere between one and minus one. And let's connect this. Maybe let's add a little more variation by adding meta scale. And I also want to drive the density um, for some good shading in here. And now let's switch to our Top camera, yes, doesn't look too bad in my opinion, or maybe that camera here. Yes, that's a nice, quick and dirty cumulonimbus um, sea of clouds. And um, now I can show you um, how you can um, limit that procedurally to a cloud noise, a cloud area without using that cloud zone actually. So again, I'll be going, um, um, into the function editor and this time I'll be using the layout area demarcation node. In versions prior to uh, view 2016, so 2015 and lower, this node um, is to be found in the filter category as the very last result in the list. So if, you're, if you don't have that layout category in an older version, go to the layout category. So what the area demarcation node actually does is it creates a circular area similar to a cloud zone. And you can indicate um, the size of the area in here. And that smoothness slider controls uh, the smooth um, fade in and fade out of the edges of the area. So um, actually it also doubles the size of uh, the area. So if that is set to one, then the area is twice as big because we now have 100% um, fall off added to the sizes in here. So let's say I want to make something along the lines of 2,500 kilometers in width and height um, times two, which would be 5,000 kilometers in size. So um, now we have an area and the inside of the area, the interior value is something that I want to fill with our fractal. So I will connect the interior value to our fractal and outside of the area I want to I don't want to have any clouds, so I will set the outside to not um, have any clouds, which is minus one or zero percent. Now let's connect the result of both in here. And um, let's have a look from below. Yeah, that looks good. And actually, I think I will be switching to both to local coordinates and correct the scale by using that multiply by 2000 from yesterday. So um, I explained yesterday um, that um, the scale changes when you switch to local coordinates. So um, that's why I need to correct that scale change. The scale is 2000 times bigger in local coordinates. So that's why I'm switching from 
um, the normal position to a position multiplied by 2000, which will get back our real world scale. And now that I have local coordinates, I can now move um, the cloud material with the layer through the scene and move our, our um, cloud area into view. Maybe increase the height a little more and the density as well. Uh, that was a little too strong, maybe. Um, yes, but anyways, now look at that. We have a nice um, sea of clouds limited to a specific area and the area itself looks um, more irregular than what we had yesterday. So um, it's not perfectly um, round at the edges. Instead, we have that irregularity down here and so, well, um, that looks really good. It's a nice cumulonimbus uh, setup with just th uh, three different nodes and um, all done within just like two minutes or so and it looks better than using the cloud zone. Um, and now we could export that one as well. So in this case, I would select um, the cloud layer, activate the cloud zone and of course, um, I'd have to increase the size of the cloud zone until it's big enough. And this is the area that we are going to export as an open VDB file. So now the area is big enough and I could go to right click export object. And we already saw those options. And that's what I did earlier. And now you could load that exported open VDB into the scene as a meta cloud. And this is the final thing that I'll be doing. So um, here it is, the, the scene that I exported earlier, the cloud layer, which was created with exactly that method that I just showed you. It's saved as an exported VDB to my library. And I can also um, load it into other applications such as Cinema 4D. I'll give that one a try so that you can see what it looks like. So let's open the export open BDB in Cinema 4D. Um, yeah, and Cinema uses um, a different axis. Uh, and I need to turn off clipping. Um, Cinema 4D is not reacting at the moment. Okay, there it is. Um, Okay, so let's, ah, there we are. Okay, so in Cinema 4D, the C and the Y axis are, um, yeah, um, exactly the opposite of what they are in view, so I need to rotate it. And here we are, I, I exported our open VDB file as a cloud for rendering with Octane or Redshift or Houdini or anything you want into another application. Um, from the cloud layer that I created. Um, yeah, and that's one of the um, best features in a new Vue version because Vue has, has, um, doesn't have to do more calculations for the density because the density information is already baked into um, that open VDB file. So it's similar to baking, um, to baking pol um, displacement to polygons. So it renders incredibly fast and on the cloud settings tab, we have a new drop down menu where you can say which um, density information to use. You can only use the density shapes as they are from the open BDB, or if you want to, you could also switch to the full uh, view internal noise and add that detail amount um, from the material into the cloud again. And it renders inc incredibly fast. I'll, I'll show you just one final test render and you'll see how quickly that one renders. And we're done. Have you ever seen a cloud render that is that fast in view before? So rendering open BDBs is perfect. Create your, create your uh, cloud material, export parts of your cloud material as a cloud layer, import that back into your scene and save 90% of your render time. And that's a new feature of the new uh, view version.
So I guess that covers everything that I wanted to show you yesterday and today. I mean, there's of course always more <laughs> than this, um, but I think um, it's such a huge topic that I, I had to select the most important points. I'll yeah. go through the final questions um, before, before we close the webinar room. <laughs> Well, uh, I'm afraid that's all the time we we have. Yeah, okay. Daniel, I'm afraid. Um, so what I've offered is for any outstanding questions to be answered in the Digital Art Live community group um, on Facebook. Um, I, I think one question that might be useful to be answered is that the audience are interested in the versions of you that this functionality, new functionality, is in. Mm -hmm. So it's um, in the new version that was released in uh, December of last year. Yeah. So everything re related to open VDB import and export and to uh, converting meshes into meta clouds is in the new version. Everything else is present in 2016 older version as well. Besides a few things, for example, opacity modulation um, is not available in older versions than 2016. Um, but that's about it and it's available in in complete infinite and extreme in the old versions or in lower versions if you have the advanced graph module that gives you access to the function editor so thank you everyone for your attention today for your questions for the chat and for daniel for packing so much information in please give him your applause and Danke, Daniel. Hanne. <laughs> we'll see Daniel again at another point in the future. Look out Thanks, guys. Oh, give a mention of your plugin. Do we have two, two or three more minutes, Paul, so that I can open it? Um, maybe just. Um, uh, we don't have any more time, I'm afraid. Okay, but, uh, okay. that's totally fine. So. Um, Guys, something that we didn't cover um, today because it's really difficult to do is how to create complex cumulonimbus formations such as the anvil thunderheads that Karen was asking about. And I've been developing sort of a plugin which is a special kind of meta note um, or a cloud material for a few years that I plan to put on sale once Cornucopia is back. And with that one, you will be able to create um, Cumulonimbus clouds, tornadoes, and um, anvil clouds with ease. And it's basically an entire interface of published parameters that I built. It's, I believe, between 50 and 80 new uh, sliders inside of the cloud material. I created um, an example video of that um, a few weeks ago for the English Facebook group. If you want me to, then um, I could repost it in the Digital Art Live group with your permission, Paul. Yep. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, plan to sell it uh, for something in between 30 and $50 and it will be a set of meta notes that you can use for different purposes. Okay. Thank you again, everyone. And we'll see you again at some point. Thank you. Thanks guys. Bye. <laughs>